Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, The Witkoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, Genova Burns. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International, NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investment Developers, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, NA, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Ten years of age, I want to be an entertainer. I want to be a comic. I don't know what I want to be. Okay, I want to be on Broadway. I want to be on Broadway. I want to be, be you, a TV. Are, are you having a moment? I'm having, having a moment. <laughs> so who do I have? I have the legendary comedian, my fellow friar, Dave Koenig. Thank you very much. This is, I'm so delighted you asked me to do this. This is going to be the most mesmerizing television since, since Ruby shot Oswald. This is going to be great. Uh, let's talk about mom and dad. How, you know, Your mom and dad or mine? Yours. Oh, okay. Especially the one, you know, the mother with the 250 pounds. My mother, was, short... my mother was five foot tall. My father was five foot two. Uh, my father was Armin Koenig. And, you... and my, my, my mother's name was Peggy, and they were very short people. Right, we have that nice little picture of them. So tell me about your parents. Where where do uh, they come from? My dad was from, well, my dad was from what is now Slovakia, you know. But at the time, it was like a remote village in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And they, he came from a family. They were the poorest Jews in all of Eastern Europe. They, they won a contest. But that was Pop's side. That was, that was my father, yeah. And, and your mother's side? And your mother's side? My mother was actually, she was actually middle class. See, her father was a very successful New York engineer. And he had, I, he had worked on the Holland Tunnel and various other big, big city projects. And uh, he had a few bucks. But what, he was also a compulsive gambler. Right, and you mentioned to me in 1929 had an opportunity to to take his money out of the market. Well, that was oh. the that was the big gamble. His 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 wife, my grandmother on my mother's side, she she uh, got pregnant late in life. It was a surprise, and so my grandfather said he said Sylvia, he said if it's a boy, I'm going to take all the money out of the stock market. I'm going to invest it in real estate. And if it's a girl, I'm going to leave it in the market, let it ride. And my mother was born two months before the stock market crash, so they lost everything on her gender, and she carried that guilt of losing the family fortune with her for the rest of her life. So how'd mom meet dad? They met in the Catskills. They met at a, at a singles joint, uh, you know, a, a camp, uh, Arrow Lodge, Camp Arrow Lodge, I think it was called. One of those places up in the Catskills so, uh, where so Jewish women go looking for Jewish men. And, and, they get, and, they get and dad, you said to me, was, uh, dad was an interesting person. He was a painter. Uh, what, what? He was a house painter. He was a house, was a house painter. I didn't say two coats. I said two, <laughs> wait, two coats? Okay. He was a two coat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, very artistic. No, we would call that a schmear. He was a schmear. He was a schmear. Well, that's what, that was one of the things my father said to me later in life. He said, he said, uh, and this is for real. He said, you do whatever you want. That was big advice. You do whatever you want with your life, but don't be a schmearer like me. 
That was his advice. So you're born in Queens, uh, yeah. in Jamaica. Now, you said to me your father would travel, and the family would travel. We were, were we you were, gypsies, Jewish We gypsies? were wandering Jews is what we were. My father was a very, very restless man, and uh, he w every couple of months, my father would get aggravated. And he, he would say, that's it, I can't stand this anymore. And, and he didn't know what to do, so he would just, he would pack up and he would move, and we would have to move with him because he had the food. So we just went, and then he would travel all over the country, and we went like that. Moved, we moved about 50 times when I was a kid, and I... I where, where around the country were you living? We moved all over New York, you know, the five boroughs, out to Long Island, back, forth, over and over again. Then we moved out to California a couple of times, then down to Florida. At one point, my father had a, a brainstorm. He was going to buy farmland in Arkansas and become a farmer in Arkansas. I remember, I remember, I remember arguing with him. About, I said, Dad, you're, you're, you're a Jew from the Bronx. What do you know about farming in Arkansas? So we spent two miserable weeks in Arkansas, and people were walking, the Razorbacks is the big team there. So there was all these people walking around with plastic red hog hats. It was a miserable experience. And we, we moved around. I went to 33 different schools. That's we'll get many, to, we'll go to your education many times we moved, in a little while. Yeah. So how do you get to become a child actor at the age of 10? Everywhere. I, I mean, your mother wanted to. She was a frustrated actress. She was a little. She had a little Mama Rose in her, and I would. When we would move, I, I, I would always. I was always the new kid in school, and I always had to make a new group of friends. And I didn't make friends for very long, or hold on to them for very long, because we would move. We literally moved every couple of months. So I got to the point where, just out of boredom, I would start reinventing myself everywhere we went. So I would present myself with a new background. I would, I would adopt an accent. I would tell people I was from, he, from different places that I actually was. I was, I was a young compulsive liar. And uh, so that's, that's training for either, you know, a career in show business or, or becoming a serial killer. So at about the age of nine, I decided uh, that I wanted to get in the show business. I love I that to... picture of you with those glasses, you know. Yes. That was a wonderful little kid. That's one of my, my early headshots. Your early headshots. My child acting days. So what, I was what, adorable. What, what, you, what were you in when you were a child? I, I did a lot of theater. Here. There was a lot of theater in New York in the 70s. You know, a lot of theater. And I did a lot of theater. I was a kid in the play, you know, in the various different plays. A lot, you know, a lot of awful stuff. I did a lot of dreck. I mean, it was terrible. I figured you were probably in The Tale of Two Cities or Charles Dickens. No, I was in you Miserable, know, Forgotten, The Happenstance Syndrome, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the Gladys's Hidden Tumor, you know, plays you never heard of, uh, you know, the, the Hernia Factor, you know, things like that. So, so what happens at 16? You said to me you were, you were a fantastic student, right? Uh, you were really... Uh, and the, right up to the moment I got kicked out of high school, I was no, a great no, no. student. No, 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 you weren't kicked out of high school. It was the principal saying to you an alternative, correct? Well, they couldn't legally kick you out, and they couldn't legally... Now, we, but you went to two good high schools. I what? went to high school of uh, uh, art and design, which is a very good school, and then I transferred to high school of music and art, which used to be up in Harlem on 137th Convent Avenue, and I went there for about six months for the 10th grade, and then the, the principal pulled me aside, and he said, he said, he said you know, he said, when you're 16, uh, you can legally drop out. You know? And I said, oh, good advice. So that was it from so, But I left home when I was 16. I ran away from home. So, so where do you live? Uh, you told me uh, you had some interesting places where you were living. At 16. Well, New York in the 70s was a very different place, you know. And uh, I think I think terrible it's, fact that gentrification it just causes grief. Well, but you, one of the you can't live cheap. No, gentrification is good, and I'll tell you why. There was no gentrification in the '70s, so I, as a teenage runaway, was able to leave home unsupervised and go out and become basically a, yeah, but a what juvenile did, delinquent. Wait a second, what do your mother and father say? They were moving did, around. They say, they, 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 I couldn't even. I didn't even know where to send a postcard. Well, okay, These people well, were, were they, they were on the loose. Kaddish, you know, for you. I don't know. No, they were very, my, we were at best reformed Jews. You know, we did the big holidays, Passover and Christmas. You know, that's So, so what that's happens at 16? What are you doing to make a living? At 16, oh, I, I uh, well, I did every conceivable manual labor you can think of. I, you know, carpentry work and painting and then janitorial work, you know, every miserable job you can think of. And then at one point I was selling uh, 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 newspaper subscriptions over the phone. Yeah, that's how you made some money because of the, the New York Times concept of you could sell a subscription, but don't worry, you get 50% at the beginning? Well, the salesman would get, a, would get a portion of the commission up front. So me and these other juvenile delinquents who were working there quickly figured out that if we put in 
basically fake sales, we'd get the commission. We'd get part of the commission. So we would call up every Chinese name in the phone book who didn't understand English, and we'd say, yeah, uh, Mr. Wong, you're getting, a, you're getting a subscription to the New York Times. And then we'd put the sale in, we'd get a partial commission, and uh, we, we, we scammed them for, for quite some time before they caught on, and they fired us all. And I, was, I was a troubled youth, essentially. So, so let's talk about your troubled youth. Then you got into, um, is it voiceovers or is it the comedy club? What happens? What, what, because you, you didn't perform for a couple of years, right? Uh, no, I was out there, yeah. The, the, I had a few years that were kind of Dave Koenig, the lost years, you know, where I was bumming around and shooting pool. And the amount of time I spent in the pool hall, I, I should be a much better pool player than I actually am now. I'm not quite sure why that is. But then, then, I, uh, then I started doing stand-up comedy. And but how, how'd that happen? Wasn't that the Adam Sandler story? Well, I was hanging out at the comic strip, which is the comedy club uptown. And I, had, I wanted to do stand-up, but I was, I was hesitant. And I would go there every day, and I'd watch all the comics. And, I, and there was one guy, Adam Sandler, was at the, at the comic strip. And he was just about to graduate out of there to TV and film. And uh, I, he would get up every night, and, and just he would bomb terribly. No one, no one would laugh at him, except for I thought he was hilarious. So after a couple of weeks, I went up to him, and I said, uh, I got up the nerve to talk to him. We started talking. And he was a very confident guy, and I wasn't because I was a little crazy. And he uh, he said he said Dave he said are you are you a comedian? I said no no I said uh, I'm not. He said well I think you should. He said you got a great voice, you got a great look. I think you'd do very well. And uh, this went on for a couple of weeks. He would he would encourage me to get up on stage, and I would kind of beg off. And then finally finally he got fed up with me, and he 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 laid down the law. And he said Koenig, if you don't get up on that stage, I'm not going to let you hang out here anymore. And I said, okay. I said, tell you what, I'll, I'll come back tomorrow and I'll show you some jokes I wrote. Came back the next day. I sat down with Adam. Now, mind you, we, we're kids. I'm in my 20s at the time. He's younger than me, but he was very confident. And he looks at my jokes. And goes, <laughs> oh, okay. He says, wait a second. And he goes inside. He, said, he whispers something to the MC. He comes back outside. He grabs me and he shoves me into the showroom. Just as the MC is introducing me, but that was you see, but that was the, it was the start. It yes, gave you the the job, the opportunity to be a comedian. He went out of his way. He literally shoved me out there on stage and forced me to to jump into the water and 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 do it. So and that's what I needed at that time. So after you jump in the water, then you do some voiceovers. Now since then, there's been many people who wanted to shove me off stage. I agree, but, but that's beside the point. Including myself. Yes. But um, what happens right now? Then you get involved with some. So now I'm doing Mapo. Uh, Maypo. Maypo. <laughs> I wish I had the Maypo account. I thought you had the Maypo. No, I, ha I had Total Serial. Oh, Total Serial. For uh, many, many years. Voiceovers was quite the great racket because voiceovers enabled me to stay. I didn't want to go out on the road because I had done uh, all that traveling as a kid, all that chaos. And I wanted, I had gotten married and I had kids and I wanted to stay home as much as I could. How'd you meet your wife? Was in, It was a very interesting story about the... Well, we met on a blind date. Here's what happened. I, I, I had done a play. It was a David Ives comedy. It was very good. And there was an actress in the play named Deborah. I don't like Deborah. And uh, we uh, were flirting a bit. And then uh, uh, after the play was over, Deborah said, you know, she said, I, there's a, a theater company I'm involved with. And they have a theatrical retreat up in the Catskills in Tannersville. She said, why don't you come up there uh, this weekend and we'll uh, work on some play readings, if you know what I'm saying, Michael. It's a euphemism. And uh, so I said, okay. So we went up to work on play readings, and then her husband showed up, which kind of put a kibosh on the plan for the weekend. So I started chasing this other girl, uh, a girl named Kathy, who's now actually on the, the show Orange is the New Black. She's very funny. And uh, I started chasing her, but Kathy wouldn't have anything to do with me. She had good taste. So I finally said to her, I said, all right, if you're not going to go out with me, you have to hook me up with one of your friends. And so she picks up the phone. She dialed a number, and she put me on the phone with this girl, Susan. And I got on the phone, and she said, are you, uh, she, and she, I said, hello. And she, we talked, and she said, you're Jewish? I said, yes. She said, uh, she said well, all right, let's go out, because she had a thing for Jewish men. She was Irish. She is Irish. She never converted from Irish. She's still Irish. And uh, so we went out on a date, and then we got married. And to this day, Kathy Curtin says to Susan, she says, I can't believe you married Koenig. I was just fixing you up as a joke, you know. But we got married, and we got four kids. So, so let's talk about some of the, the things that happened in your life. Um, I think it was the Metro Channel where uh, 
you, you started uh, on TV? The no, no, well, I, I had a no, I had a show on HBO right, that uh, was back the in the 90s called Hardcore TV. It was a late night sketch comedy show that I hosted, and uh, it was a little bit of a risque show, you know, because it was HBO, so you know they could do whatever they wanted. And I, I would, I was there to add a little class to the proceedings. I'd come out in between the sketches and right. say, you know, clever things like. <laughs> get a lot of that girl. Right, like and, that. and then after that, then you had the opportunity to audition for the Carol Burnett show? Oh, Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett was doing a big comeback. In the, this is on CBS, and it was called Carol and Company. She was going to have a new sketch comedy show, and I auditioned for Remember, it. Remember, we only have 26 minutes. Okay. Well, you brought it up, and uh, I auditioned for it, and then uh, they had the callback was out in California. I had to fly out to California, and I, uh, the audition, the callback was with Carol Burnett. And she loved you. She loved me. She loved you, but then when you had to change your voice. She loved me. I did one take with this sketch we did. It was great. And then the producer said, do a second take, but do it completely differently. Do the exact opposite. And I did, and it was a big bomb. And then Carol Ben, she, she had her arms around me. She said, oh, I don't need to see anymore. And I was spending the money. I was going with my, And then she shook my hand. She said, thank you for coming. And that was it. I flew back. To now, me. few people. But that's show business. Okay, few it's people. up and down. Now, wait. I'm Vince here. Fontaine? On Broadway. Vince Fontaine on Broadway? On Broadway. Greece? I mean, how'd that happen? Especially with that voice. Well, I am not known as a singer. That's so right. the idea of being in a Broadway musical. But talk about how the producer, the major producer, found you. Well, I, I got called in to audition for the, to play uh, Vince Fontaine, the DJ. And the DJ and the character was supposed to do some comedy to warm up the audience before the show. I went to see the show the night before the audition. I watched the guy I was auditioning to replace. And he's warming up the crowd before the show, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking... We call that the Tumla. He was, it's exactly what he was doing. It's like a Catskills Tumla. And I'm sitting there thinking, I can do this. And then I watched him during the first act, and he's interacting with the audience, he's interacting with the other characters. I think, I can do this. The end of the first act, I had a premonition. Broadway, I never thought I would be on Broadway. In a musical, I don't sing. And I had a premonition. I said, not only, not only can I do this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this job, I'm going to be on Broadway. Second act starts. Intermission, second act. There's the guy playing Vince Fontaine. He's center stage. They have the four backup singers come up. They come behind him, and he's belting out a big, big number to open the second act. And he sings really well. And I'm thinking, I can't do this. I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't sing. I go to the audition. There's, there's Barry Weisler, the producer. Now, this guy, I'm telling you, $4,000 suit, beautiful tan, every hair in place. He looks like a million bucks. He's marvelous. And he says, do some of the warm-up comedy. I do. He says, oh, you're great. He says, do a little of the scenes. I do. Oh, this guy, I love this. This guy's fantastic. He says, can you sing? I said, Barry, <laughs> can I sing? Can I sing? <laughs> no, I can't sing. Here's what you do. Take the four backup singers. Take their mics all the way up. Take my mic down. I'll fake my way through it. No one will care. He says, it works for me. So I would do that number, and they would turn my mic down, but every two weeks I'd get carried away, and I would belt this song out like Ethel Merman, and the musical director would come up to me after the performance. He'd say, Dave, Dave, great show tonight, but the, we could hear you sing. And I, so so after, after Greece, then you get to Metro TV? Then I did Metro TV. No, the, was the US, well, Metro oh, the TV, USA, USA Network. Network. You had a very long talk show. Five minutes? They gave me five minutes once a week. But the best one, which, and I had, which I, so is, I had the which world's is shortest video, talk show, is you and Abe Vigoda. We did a Christmas special with Abe Vigoda as my guardian angel. It was a, it's a Wonderful Life parody, and he showed me what life would be like if I had never been born. So you hit the USA Network, and then you hit Metro, where you won three Emmys. I won three. I, I brought one of my Emmys today. See, I have the golden apple. I could have yeah. brought all three, but that would be ostentatious. Yes. So I just... I, do you have a nice shot of the Emmys? <laughs> okay. Do you have that? You got that? Okay, there? we got it. We Emmy. got it. Yeah. It's and not my Emmy. That was for Subway Q&A. I ran around on the subway and interviewed people, and it was a funny show. Now, uh... After Subway Q&A, what happened was, unfortunately, it was 9-11. Right. And you were entertaining the people down at the... I was with the USO, and they sent me down to Ground Zero to entertain the, the workers and the, the police and the troops and the firemen at the uh, respite centers. And I would also escort the uh, movie stars who were going down and greet people. Marissa Tomei, who's a doll, and John Travolta, who I don't understand why Scientology can't do something for his hair, but uh, all these people. And uh, I was down there for, for about a month solid right after the attack, you know, from September to October. Uh, and it had an effect on me, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a profoundly affecting experience. And it kind of knocked me for a little bit of a loop. And it had two odd uh, uh, um, 
uh, side effects on me. One was I joined the military. You joined the Guard. I joined the State Guard, which is augmentation for the National Guard, and I served that for, uh, for, for many years. And then the other was uh, I went through a kind of a spiritual thing where I, I looked at my childhood and my life, and I never really had any religious uh, uh, background per se. And um, I had married this beautiful Irish Catholic girl, and we were taking our kids to Catholic church on Sundays, you know, and I was there for crowd control. And I would go to these churches, and I would think, you know, this is the spoke and miracles and men in robes. It was like, it was like Vegas. It was show business, you know. It was like Siegfried and Roy. So I thought, I need something, you know. So I converted. I converted to Catholicism, but I thought, you know, let me, I'm not going to talk about it because it's a little odd, and I wouldn't bring it up at the Friars Club, for example. So let's talk about after that, because then you did, you, I, I, you know, your wife is an author. Right. She's written three very funny books. And, and what happened was Cardinal Egan uh, made a deal with Sirius Radio right. for the Catholic Network, the Catholic, the Catholic uh, Channel, Channel Talk, the Catholic Channel, yeah. and how they find now the converted Jew right, okay, right. and the Irish Catholic. Yes. So here you, ha you, here you had a, 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 a loudmouth opinionated Jewish comedian attempting to be a good Catholic. Three hours a day, right? And you had the Catholic Church running a radio uh, station, you, you know, a, a medium that thrives on the open around the country. Of discussion. And if you ever listen to the people who listen to Sirius around the country, <laughs> they are truckers. You yeah. know, they're, they're... I mean, what 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 could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know? So they they gave they want they wanted my wife to do a radio show, and she she said I'll do it, but only if I can do it with my comedian husband. So they gave us a deal. We did a five day a week, three hour a day. Did this for two years, a talk show on the, on a Catholic channel and uh, I got back pains I got migraines it was very stressful working for the Catholic Church because I'm Jewish you know and it was all oh, and you also couldn't say certain things that you did well exactly and I was very uh, you know I, I had a little trouble and some of your shut. guests were a little were members of the friars well in order to, to make myself comfortable I booked every Jewish comedian and I had David Brenner I had David Steinberg I had Freddie Roman I had Stewie Stone I had I mean every Jew at the Friars Club was on my show so they didn't know what to make of me you know they they were very confused so now me. you had another epiphany right yes Okay, so talk about the epiphany. Are you walking on 47th Street one day on, west, on the west side? I mean, the west side, not in the diamond. District. Well, I got, it, I got us fired, you know, from the Catholic Channel. They finally had enough of me, and they, they, they got, you know, my wife got us hired, and I got us fired because, you know, marriage is a team effort, Michael. And, and uh, so, so I, I, the effect it had on me was, it was uh, I, want, I, I felt this need to get back to my Judaism. You know, because I'm peripatetic, I can't, I can't keep, a, I can't keep a, a straight thought in my head. So I'm walking down the street one day, and I, I, I never found a temple I was comfortable in, because I've been in show business all my life. That, this is what I know. And I walk into the Actors Temple here in New York City, and they got pictures on the wall of Milton Berle and the Three Stooges and Eddie Cantor and, and Sophie Tucker, and I said, this is my kind of religion. This is where I'm comfortable. So I started going to services at the Actors Temple, and I converted back to Judaism, and uh, I'm finally comfortable with being uh, but wait, what I am. And you did a show. You created so a I show created a show about this whole experience called Hebrew School Dropout, or how I converted from Judaism to Catholicism and back to Judaism and lost those stubborn last 10 pounds. Now, I'm surprised you lost the stubborn 10 pounds because <laughs> converting back to Judaism, you went back to the bagels and the knishes. The bagels and, and the, the other. Yeah, the rugula. Right? The, yes. the rugula. And, and the, the macaroons, the, the, which is my real weakness. So besides that, you know, let's talk about the you, Dave Koenig and the Catskills. Oh. Uh, before you closed the, uh, <laughs> was it Kutcher's that you closed? I closed Kutcher's. In the entire history, of the of the of Jewish resorts in the Catskills, I in the entire history of Catskills comedy, you are you are talking to. I am the last comic to play the last Jewish resort in the Catskills. I closed Kutcher's, and Kutcher's will uh, reopen in the fall as the Museum of Mold. Kutcher's was uh, a little run down last few years, and they would send me up there because there was a rabbinical prohibition against using a microphone on the Sabbath. And I would do shows there on Friday nights and on the holidays for the, for the Orthodox uh, people there. And I would do shows that, without a microphone. 
Right. The lights were allowed to be put on because they had the Shabbos. They had the Shabbos Goy to turn on the lights, but I, for some reason the Shabbos Goy was not allowed. I don't know if it was a union thing, but he couldn't turn on the microphone. So I would have to do a whole show an hour long without a microphone. And so they would get comics who couldn't do it. They couldn't work without a mic. But because I have this theatrical background and this big voice, I could project. So Kutcher's is the, was the only hotel, any other hotel in the world, if they don't see the show, they ask you, how was the comedian? Was he funny? And Kutcher's all they cared about. How was the comedian? Could you hear him? Did you hear him? Oh, he, that's good. So I'd go up there, I'd do the show, they could hear me. I was a big hit. But Kutcher's forced me in the Catskills forced me to use comedy muscles I didn't even know I had. I had to, I had to, I had to do a tremendous amount of working with the crowd and, and projecting my voice. I had to change my act completely. And it was really quite a, a growth uh, artistically uh, because I had to face that adversity of having to work in this dumpy place without a mic. So, so what do you, you were the, with the, uh, the opening act with the Duprees? I op I'm a big hit with older crowds. I don't know, you know, because when I walk out on stage, I got cufflinks and, you know, older people feel comfortable. They know he's, he's, the guy's not in a T-shirt. They know I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, you know, knock so him out. Too talk many. about the Duprees. So I open for the Duprees. I open, I open for big acts. I'm opening for Bill Haley's Comets. These guys got to be in their 90s. Bill Haley's Comets. I'm opening for them next month. Uh, so all kinds of music acts I open for. And what, what about the, you in Philadelphia uh, doing uh, Mushu? Uh... I just did a show with Stewie Stone, our friend from the Friars Club. We did the, it was a show on Christmas Eve. It was the Mushu Jew show. It was Jewish comedians and Chinese food on Christmas Eve for, for a Jewish audience, and they would pack them in in this Chinese restaurant in Philadelphia. It was every comedian's dream to have to compete for the audience's attention with duck sauce. But this is what we did. And so today you're continuing, you're on the road. All the time. All the They're road. working. You know, I got four kids. I got to work. So I, talk about the four kids and their, their names and what they're doing. I got four. Remember the names. But I look kids. at them and I just think tuition, food bills. That's all I see. My oldest daughter is a beautiful girl and very talented Her name, and smart. You, you remember Her people. Her name is Sarah. Hopefully they watch the show. Sarah. And she goes to Georgetown. And she's studying theater. Fifty thousand dollars a year for theater. This okay, is that's Georgetown. Georgetown. My uh, my oldest son, very smart boy. He's a journalism student, very talented journalism uh, uh, writer, and he is going to SUNY Stony Brook. And he's a smart boy, and and uh, we'll let You're him. You're very out. happy because the tuition is much less than. Georgetown. It's a little less than Georgetown, but still, I mean, it all adds up. Yes. And then and the, I got I got a I got a 15 year old boy, uh, Nick, very talented filmmaker, comedian. Theater guy, great. And he wants to be a comedian. Yeah, he's a funny is guy. He, is he in acting like his He's in acting, but in school. In okay, school. See, I wouldn't let him act professionally. You won't let him act no, professionally? No, no. Stay in school, get your degree, do all the school plays you want, do all the summer theater you want, but you stay in school and you get your degree, and then you can go and ruin your life. And, 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 then, and then the 10-year-old? Then we got a 10-year-old. We, we, we thought we were done at three, but then we had the fourth one who we named Oops. So he's, he hangs around the house and he eats. You know, they all eat. <laughs> What's Oops? How old is Oops? He's a, he's a nine-year-old boy. His name is Matthew. He's a talented cartoonist. They all have talent, these kids. We, uh, you're not allowed to hang out in my house unless you have talent. Okay. You know, for the, the kid who traveled, you know, around the cities and the country, 30 little locations All over, over the there, All you over. know, who then progressed to probably being a, uh, a variety of jobs, a laborer, a carpenter, a voiceover. Oh, everything. Okay. You know, I think it's been interesting, even though this should be my Emmy. This is my Emmy. Okay. It should be my Emmy. And thank three, you very much. three of these. Okay. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. And my Emmy thanks you. Okay.